Welcome first graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to give a special welcome to two schools who are with us this afternoon. Uh, we have students from the Marcellus STEAM Academy with us today and students from Martha Turner Riley Elementary with us today. Thank you so much for joining us. <clears throat> we wish you could be here in person, um, but since you can't, we're gonna do our best to make you feel like you're here during a virtual field trip today. If you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. Once you get there, you can get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. And this afternoon's field trip is called Natural Sources of Water. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that the natural world includes rocks, soil, and water that can be observed in cycles, patterns, and systems. Students will observe and compare a variety of natural sources of water, including streams, lakes, and oceans. So we're gonna start off today by exploring different natural sources of water with Ms. Nash. Next, we're going to explore color and clarity with Mr. Monroe. Third, we're gonna do an investigation called the Egg Investigation with Dr. Gorman. And last but not least, you're gonna see another investigation called Drops of Water led by me. While we're doing all of that, you can ask us questions and we encourage you to ask questions. Uh, but since this is a virtual field trip, the way you'll do that is you'll go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And once you're gonna, once you get there, you fill out a super short form to ask any questions you have for us related to water. You can ask as many questions as you like, and we will do our best to answer all of them in the time that we have with you this afternoon. So let me stop sharing my screen here and turn it over to Ms. Nash, Nash who's going to get us started with natural sources of water. Hello, welcome to my classroom. And today we're talking about water. And there's a lot of it around. There's a lot this weekend. And if you were here on a field trip, real in person, we would be going for a walk. So I did go for a walk last Friday and to look for some water around here. This is what we would be doing. So let's go see what I found. Share this. Some pictures I took. So these pictures I actually took yesterday because it snowed. Did you see that snow? It was so beautiful. It looked like a lot of snow, but it all melted. Did you get to go out and take a walk in it? I hope it was so beautiful, but it melted. So all those little drops of water, there they are on the leaves of that plant. And they, on my patio, they made little puddles of water. Some of it, a lot of it soaked into the ground, but some of it stayed behind as a puddle. Now, when I went for my walk on Friday, I saw these dark clouds and I thought, hmm, it may rain on me. Because up in those clouds, there are tiny drops of water, or water vapor that became drops of water and they made the clouds. And if there are enough of them, they may fall out as rain. Now, here's some puddles I found on my walk. See those little puddles? You might like to jump in them, get muddy. But those puddles came from that. On the right hand side, you see that tank for the animals to drink out of? It's really full. And the water that overflowed from the tank made those puddles. But that water, see that hose there? It's coming from the windmill. So the windmill is turning in the wind and pumping, pumping up water from underground. When it rains a lot, the water soaks through the ground, down underground, kind of like a, a pond underground or sometimes a river underground. And we can dig a well or have a windmill and we can get that water from underground. It's called groundwater because it's underground. And that's what we're using for the animals. I kept on walking and I found a pond. So a pond, um, Mary and I have a stream coming in too. It's not usually very big. You might have a fish pond at school, right? or you can go look at a pond in a park maybe. And this pond is filled by the rainwater. It was almost dry just a few weeks ago and then it rained and rained and it filled back up almost all. It filled pretty good. Here's the edge of that pond. You see it's muddy around the edge and it was full 
color than it is now. See that white line there that shows you where the water was up there and then it went back down. So it evaporates out. Okay. If it doesn't rain anymore, it may go almost dry again. So this pond is filled just with rainwater. And the rainwater runs off and you see the dam behind it to kind of try to keep it in. I kept on walking and I found our our lake. We have a, a small lake over here. We have a bigger one on the other side of the road in the post oak. This one is a small lake. And again, it's filled by rainwater. Okay. But this summer, it was so dry that there's no water at all in that whole big lake. So sadly, all the fish and all the animals that lived there either died or the ones that could walk hopefully walked away to find water somewhere else. So here, our lakes and pond are dependent on the rainwater. They're filled only by the rain. I'm gonna stop sharing. Where did it go? Well, I did it already. So we're gonna think about different kinds of bodies of water that we might find around. And the first one would be a drop. So all the water that we have around starts out as a drop of water, a tiny drop of water. And they fall down into rain and they can make a puddle. And in a puddle, you might find a puddle duck. Our ducks like to dabble around in the puddles, okay? We also can find insects or tadpoles. We're like, wow. And froggies like to lay their eggs in a, a puddle rather than a pond or a lake, because in a puddle, there usually aren't any fish. It's just going to dry up sooner or later. And mama frog is hoping that her her tadpoles will have time to grow up before the puzzle evaporates. So more rain, we would get up more water, we get a pond, the laguna. And in a pond, you might have froggies, you might have some goldfish. If you have a pond at school, it might have koi in it, or any kind of little fish, and a big bird that might come to hunt those fish. And then with more water, we get a lake, lago. And in a lake, we have bigger fish. We might have some water snakes. We might have an otter. We might have a big turtle. Okay. So different kinds of animals will live in different kinds of bodies of water, depending on how, how much water is in there. And then, of course, we get to the ocean. So ocean, most of our planet is ocean amazing really living on planet ocean so we've got whales and sharks and sea turtles and seahorse and eel and octopus and this really cool fish called the oarfish aren't those cool a little friend of mine did those drawings for me they're so pretty so i'm going to take a little break here i'll let them stand up with me okay so i'll stand up and put your hands up Hand over your head and the rain is going to fall down all the way down, down, down to the ground. All those little drops, drops of rain falling down. And I make a puddle, I make a pond, a laguna, a lake, a lago, an ocean, a sand. And the ocean goes all the way around the earth, okay? Go around and around and around and around. Okay, let's do it again. Ocean, lake, pond, puddle. Again, Oceano, Lago, Laguna, Char, Cotita, Cotita, Charco, Laguna, Lago, Oceano. Okay, again, Ocean, Lake, Pond, Puzzle, Drop. Now, you know, there's lots of things around us to look at and observe and learn about. And a good thing to do would be go find a puzzle or a pond or a lake in the parks around town, usually there's a lake, okay, of some kind. And go there and look and see, what can you see? What can you observe? And then you can draw a picture, okay, of what you saw, what animals you saw, what the water looked like. Do some observation outside. So thank you. And uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Broughton for any questions. 
Thank you, Ms. Nash. The question that came in was, how many oceans are there? And there are five commonly recognized oceans, which are all connected. Um, their names are the Atlantic, the Pacific, the Indian, the Arctic, and the Antarctic Oceans. So there are uh, five oceans that you need to know. Um, now we're going to pass it over to Mr. Monroe for color and clarity of water. Okay, good afternoon, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and we're gonna be talking about water as far as color is concerned, and clarity, meaning clearness, okay? Now, often the question is asked, is pure water really clear? Well, not really. Most pure water will have a little bluish, slight bluish color to it. Take, for example, I have a glass of some very good drinking water. And if we were to really, really take a good look at this water, maybe getting the help of the sun if we were outside, we would see that there is just a slight bluish tint to this water. Now, because this water is clear, that also kind of indicates to me that maybe this water would be good to drink. Water is very important to us too, isn't it? It is essential to life on our planet. So I'm gonna go ahead and take me a drink. Hmm. That tastes like pure water. If you saw water that had a little different color to it, would you feel safe in drinking it? I don't think I would. So if water has a different kind of color to it, that is an indicator that maybe that water may not be safe to drink. Now, water can be of uh, different colors, okay? It can have different colors simply because of maybe its origin or maybe there's something in the water. Uh, take, for example, Miss Nash was talking about our pond. Well, the other day, before we got the snow, I went down to the edge of the pond and I took a sample of pond water. And if you look at this pond water, you can see that there's something in it. It's kind of greenish in color. So it would give the water a greenish or a yellow coloring. And basically what's in there is a plant growth that grows in the pond called green algae. Do you think this water would be good to drink? I don't think so, okay? You also heard Miss Nash talk about water that is trapped in the ground. You know, the amazing thing about it is, you know, if you were here with us, we'd walk out to the well where the windmill is. That windmill has the blades like a propeller that's up in the air, turned sideways, that when the wind blows, it uses the wind's energy to run a pump to bring some of that groundwater that's about 30 feet below there. It brings it to the top. And you know what? Most students, when they actually see that, guess what? They are amazed. You would think that if it's trapped in the ground, that it would be the color of dirt, right? Well, here I have a sample of well water. It looks like pure water, doesn't it? And uh, you heard her mention that we also use this water to give our animals out here that live in the barn and in the pasture, we give them that water so that they can drink it. And you know what? If we had it tested for bacteria or germs and it came out that we didn't have the germs, we could also drink this water. Well water, when it doesn't have any bacteria, it's very good, okay? Now, water can change color simply because uh, maybe the soil that's underneath it or the soil that is around it. And uh, take for example, there's a river that separates Texas and Oklahoma. And I don't know whether you all have gone to visit anybody in Oklahoma, but you'll cross this bridge. And as you cross the bridge, it says, now you're in the state of Oklahoma. Well, crossing that bridge, that bridge crosses 
the river that they call the Red River. Now, students listen. They call it the Red River because if you look down, you will see that the soil on each side of that river is reddish brown in color. Now, I have actual dirt from that side or from that river is riverbed. And that dirt is a reddish brown. And I'm going to mix a little bit in the water and you're going to see what happens. Now I'm going to do a little bit of stirring to get that soil to mix in. And we can see, look at that. It's reddish brown. And so that's how that river gets its name, the Red River. What it also means, because it's, because it's reddish brown in color, if I was brave enough, which I'm not, and I took a drink of this, guess what? I would taste kind of a metal in my mouth because usually red soil indicates that there is a bit of that metal mineral that we call iron in it. So that would not be good to drink, would it? Now the soil that we have around here is a little darker in color. And let's see what happens when I mix a little of it in another beaker of water and see what color it will be. I'm gonna mix that in there. It's not mixing too, well. I'm gonna make a mess. It's turning brown, guys, dark brown. So there is a bit of difference in the color of this water and the color of that water, right? So the surrounding environment has a big impact on the color of the water that is found in that particular nature area or natural area, okay? Now, students, I've often heard students ask, why is the ocean blue? Well, guess what? The water in the ocean, it is said that it reflects the light coming from the sky. And most of the time, and there's no clouds in the sky, what color is the sky? Blue. But you know, it even goes further than that because there are little bitty tiny parts of water that we call molecules. Have you guys ever seen a rainbow? If you've seen a rainbow, you will notice that a rainbow has a lot of different colors, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. And you know, those are the basic colors of the natural light that come from the sun. And the way that a rainbow forms is the fact that usually toward the end of the rain or storm, the rays or the light waves coming from the sun penetrate the water droplets and the water droplets will separate those light rays into those basic colors of light, okay? Now, the same thing happens in the ocean because when the sun shines on the ocean, guess what? That same rainbow is forming in the water that we call the ocean. Of course, the colors red, orange, yellow, green, they're all absorbed by those little bitty tiny particles that we call molecules. But blue, indigo, and violet, they're just kind of scattered out. They don't get absorbed by those little particles that we call molecules. So what happens is they kind of spread out and they give a bluish color to ocean water. Now, one thing about it, if you were to dive into that ocean, and you had the ability to go really deep in the ocean, it would change from that blue, guess what? To a very dark black, okay? Now, that kind of talks about water and the many colors that water can be. What I wanna share with you next is that word clarity. Clarity means clearness, clearness of the water. And that's very important, not just so that we can drink it, because we don't want to drink all clear water anyhow. 
It's because of the ability for sun to penetrate clear water so plants can grow underneath the water. Very important. We know that plants are important to us. So plants are also important to the fish and other animals that live in the water that need oxygen and food. Now, since I said that, it's very important that we know how clear the water. There's a big word that we use out here. It's called turbidness or turbidity. I have an instrument that we use out here called a turbidity tube. Now, hopefully you can see this, that in this tube, if you're looking at it, you can see a black and white design at the very base of this tube, okay? I want you guys to remember what that looks like, okay? You see it? All right, I'm gonna pour some of this uh, Red River water that I made up. I'm gonna pour some of this just a little bit. Don't wanna pour too much. Now, I'm gonna turn this up. Well, let's see. Let's see if I can angle my camera down a little bit. Can you guys see that black and white design real good through that water? Maybe not. So, that's not good, is it? Let's pour just a little bit of the groundwater in there. Let's see here. Can you see it? Yeah, we can see it pretty good. So, that water's pretty clear. The turbidity is low. Now, on the Red River water, the turbidity was high. Couldn't hardly see. Very important that the water is clear and has good turbidness to it for the animals and living things that live in that water. So students, listen. Hopefully I've given you a, a little bit of knowledge about colors of water, and the importance of clarity of water. Besides, if you go to a swimming pool and you jump in and you're swimming and you try to open your eyes up under the water while you're swimming under the water, wouldn't it be better for you to open your eyes in clear water than dirty water? I want you guys to have a good day. And if any of you have any questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton and maybe he can answer those questions for you. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. A question that came in was, what are all the different colors of water? And water can be um, practically all the colors of the rainbow, uh, depending on what's in it. And uh, one way to see that is if you did some research on algae blooms. Algae, um, Mr. Monroe spoke to about it a little bit. Um, that's a microorganism that lives in water and it can be all kinds of different colors, uh, depending on what kind of water it's living in and what the temperature of that water is. And it can turn uh, water uh, lots of different colors. So if you wanna see some really unusual colors of water, research algae blooms and you'll see that. All right, now we're gonna do the egg investigation with Dr. Gorman. All right. Good afternoon, students. My name is Dr. Gorman, and today we're going to do an experiment with eggs and water. We're going to see if the egg will float in the water. Now, today we're going to use three vocabulary words, and I know that these are big words, and you're not used to them. You probably have never heard of them, but you will throughout your science studies all the way through high school and college, especially this first one. This is what I really want you to remember, this word today. It's called hypothesis. And a hypothesis is nothing in the world but a guess. You guess or you think what's going to happen. If we do, if we put an egg in the water, is it going to sink or is it going to float? And we're going to find out if different kinds of water will make a difference. Uh, the next word is density. Density is the amount of something that we can put in a certain volume, a certain size. Uh, what we're going to use today is water. If we have one cubic centimeter, which is about the size of a dice, 
if we use one cubic centimeter space and we and put water in it and fill it up, it would weigh one milliliter. Well, that's our standard for today. How much of something that you can put in a certain volume? And the next word is buoyancy. Buoyancy is nothing in the world but a word that means will it float? If I go out in my backyard and jump in my swimming pool, I don't float very well. I go straight to the bottom. Glove, 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 I go, you know? Then I have to push off a swim or try to get back to the top. So I'm not very buoyant. On the other hand, my wife can get in that pool and all she has to do is just splash her arms a little bit or kick her feet a little bit every once in a while and she just floats around on top of that water. So she's very buoyant. The word is buoyancy and it means will it float. And now the materials that we're going to use today in this experiment is we're going to use two brown eggs and I've got some eggs. Now it doesn't matter if you use brown eggs or if you use white eggs or if you use some of our blue and green eggs that we have out here because the inside of them is all the same. This egg has a density of just a little bit more than one. And remember water had a density of one. Okay, so the egg, and we're gonna use two different ones. Egg has a density of a little bit more than one. Okay, the next thing that we're gonna use, and, and I'm showing you some of this stuff because this is stuff that you're gonna use when you get into the science labs and all later on in your science career. This is called me measuring spoons. Your mother may use the measuring spoons when she cooks a lot of times to get an exact measurement. And this one, what we're gonna to use today is one tablespoon. And the next thing is we have two glass containers. I'm just gonna show you one of them, but they're the same. They're 500 milliliter beakers. It's a science piece of equipment and it's called a beaker. Now I was told this by my science teacher when I was about your age, because it looks like a bird's beak on the front here, makes it easier to pour. I would think that it would be called a mini beaker or half beaker because it doesn't have the top beaker, but they didn't ask me whenever they named it. They just went ahead and named it. Now we've got two containers of water. And I'm gonna be very careful with this because I overfilled it. And we have two containers of water that we're gonna use. The other thing we're gonna use, another thing we're gonna use it's just plain old table salt. This salt came from here in East, here in Texas. There's a big salt company down in Grand Saline, which means big salt, down in East Texas. Uh, your Martin salt and all comes from right here in Texas. And what we're going to do is we're going to simulate the ocean water by putting our own salt in it. Okay, and we have a set of tongs. We'll use these in different size things, usually whenever something's very hot. Today, we're going to use them, to pick up the eggs and put them down in the water. And the last thing is a stirring device. Now, usually in the labs, we use a little glass rod that we stir things with. Today, we're going to use a plain old spoon, just a stirring device, something to stir up the water. Now, remember a while ago, I told you about hypothesis. So you're going to make a hypothesis in a minute. I'm going to take one of the glass containers and we're going to fill it about three fourths of the way full. That's up about right here. And watch me make a mess. No, all oh, good. Okay, let's see what we have here. We have right just about, we're gonna go ahead and make it 400. Now, the good thing about these beakers, one thing you'll like is they have the numbers on the side of them about how much it's holding. So right now we have our glass beaker. We put 400 milliliters of fresh water. This is water just like you get out of the faucet. You can drink it if you want to. Mr. Monroe a while ago was talking about drinking water and not drinking water. This is good water. You drink it every day, okay? We have 400 milliliters. Now we're going to take one of the eggs, but before we do this, you're going to make your hypothesis. Remember I talked about hypothesis is your guess. You're going to guess whether this egg, when I put it in this water, is going to sink or if it's going to float. 
what do you think it's going to do? Now, it doesn't matter whether you get it right or not, because you're making scientific information that will tell us something later. So you could be wrong in your hypothesis and still get credit for it because you do, you're doing something right. Now, let's see if I can get this egg in this tongue to put it in this water without me breaking it. Okay, and this is a good egg. I forgot to mention, these eggs were furnished to us by our resident hen here in the building. And her name is Lauren. I told Lauren a couple of days ago, I needed a couple of eggs for an experiment. So she ate her feed, turned it into energy, made me two eggs for you guys to do an experiment today. Your hypothesis, will it sink or will it float? An egg in fresh, plain water. And look at that. It went right straight to the bottom. It did like I do when I jump into my pool out there. Okay, was your hypothesis right or was it wrong? Now we're going to do a different one. We're going to simulate ocean water. Mr. Monroe was talking to you about how clear or how the color of ocean water is. I'm going to talk to you about how salty it is. I had an experience way before you guys were born, probably before your mother and daddy was born. I was in the Navy and I was a search and rescue person in a helicopter. We had to make several rescues in the ocean. And we wore a swimming mask on our face. Okay, but I jumped, when you jump out of the helicopter though, you have the mask on your head and you hold it with your hand like this. And then when you hit the water, then you pull it down on your face, but you don't want it on the waist when you jump in the water. And it's tied to your vest, so you're not going to lose it anyhow. But I forgot to hold it. Jumped out of the helicopter, I landed in the ocean, went underwater, and I went, whoo! And I swallowed just about half of the Pacific Ocean. Now, if you've ever been to the ocean, and someday you will if you haven't, taste a little bit of it. Just put it on your finger and taste it. That is the saltiest thing you've ever had in your life. And about three days later, I was still spitting that water out, trying to make my mouth back to normal. And we're going to put, let's try five tablespoons of salt in this beaker. I don't know if that's enough or not, but we're going to find out. That's two. That's three. That's four. That is five. Remember when you're doing your experiments, you always want to be accurate. That's why we use the measuring spoon. We don't just pour it in there. Now we're going to put 400 milliliters of water just like we did in the other one. Okay, there's our 400 milliliters. Now we're going to use this very scientific device, stirring instrument called a spoon. All right, we're going to stir it up, stir it up, stir it up, very good. We're going to see. Remember, this is ocean water. Now, it's supposed to be ocean water. We're making our own here. Mr. Broughton said there were five oceans. Well, we've got the environmental center ocean. So we have actually six of them. We're going to get another egg. Remember, these are brown eggs. They could be white. The only reason I got brown eggs is because when you do this part of the experiment, you can't see it. The water is not, what did he say, clarity a while ago. The water is not very clear. All right, let's put the egg in there and see what happens. Okay, I don't know whether you can see that or not, but this egg is floating right around the top. Now I'm going to try to push it up to the side. Maybe you can see it a little bit better if I get it still in there. After a while, can you see that brown egg at the top of that water? It's floating around. It is very buoyant. Remember, buoyancy a while ago. The egg is very buoyant. It is floating. Was your hypothesis right or was it wrong? Did the egg float in the salt water or did it sink like it did in the fresh water? All right. The three vocabulary words that we learned today, hypothesis, that's an educated guess. Density, that's the amount of something that's in a certain volume. And we uh, use buoyancy. Will it sink or will it float? In fresh water, our egg went straight to the bottom. It did not float. In salt water or the ocean, 
it did float. It had more buoyancy. Okay, we're going to let Mr. Broughton answer any questions that you might have. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dr. Gorman. Um, didn't get any new questions, but I did notice that Leonardo and Chloe from Martha Turner Riley uh, submitted the form but forgot to type in their question. So if you do have a question for us, um, just go to that form again. You can, you can go as many times as you need to and uh, type in your question before you click submit. All right, now I'm gonna share my screen here so we can get started with the water drop uh, investigation. Just takes me a second to uh, get my iPad paired with the uh, laptop here. I think you're gonna start seeing something in just a minute. There we go. So you can see I've got a, uh, a penny right here that I'm gonna start with. It's just sitting on a jar, just the jar just to hold the penny up a little higher. I've got a beaker of water back here and a dropper. And what I wanna find out is how many drops of water fit onto that penny. Um, but before I do that, I've got to make a prediction and uh, show you, I guess, one more tool that I'm going to use today, and that is a science notebook. So here you can see I've uh, made a little table that said the title of my investigation is Drops of Water, and I'm going to test a penny, a quarter, a dime, and a nickel. And I'm, first, I'm going to predict how many drops of water will fit on that coin, and then I'm going to do the investigation and write down the actual number of drops of water that fit on that coin. So for a penny, I used a ruler and I measured the length of that penny and uh, it's about two centimeters long or that's 20 millimeters. And so I'm gonna write down for my prediction, 20 drops of water because uh, a drop is pretty small, a millimeter is pretty small. Maybe that will be the correct number of drops that fit on that penny, but now we'll find out. So I'm gonna suck up some water here and start dropping it on that penny. Let me focus that a little better. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, oh, there it came off. So there were 18 drops that fit before it finally um, I fell off there. So let me dry off my jar here, set my penny off to the side. I guess I'm gonna get that completely dry before I put my next coin there and record in my notebook, 18 drops. So that was pretty close. I predicted 20, it was 18, not too bad. Now I'll try the quarter. So there's my quarter, I'm gonna set it down here and if you measure the length of a quarter, it's about 25 millimeters long. And so since I predicted 20 for the penny, but it was a little less, maybe I'll predict 24 for the quarter and we'll see what happens. So uh, let me get my dropper here again. And I'll start dropping drops on it. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen. 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30. Oh, and there it came off. So 29. And let me clean that up before it gets to be too messy on my desk here. 
So 29 drops. So quite a few more because a quarter is significantly bigger than a penny. So uh, now we'll do the dime. And you know the dime is a little bit smaller than a penny. Not by a lot, but if I hold these two up, kind of the penny right over or the dime right over the top of the penny, you can still see the edge of that penny outside of that dime which tells you that that penny is just a little bit bigger. So uh, maybe for my prediction for the dime, I'll say 18 drops. And let's put the dime on there and uh, test it out. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, six, oh, 15. Well, let me dry that one. And it was less. And actually, now that I think about it, I shouldn't have predicted 18 for the dime because if the actual for the penny was 18, I should have predicted a little less. But I could have done a little better job. But um, I said 18, so I have to write it down. Uh, so now I've got some questions to for you to think about is how much would fit on a nickel? Um, I'm not going to do that one. That can be your challenge question. If you have a nickel at home and, and a water and a dropper, you could see how many drops of water fit on the nickel, but what would you predict before you do it and then find the actual? And um, another question I have is, if I did this exact same investigation again, would I get the same results again? Uh, you might be surprised to learn that um, you don't always, like if I try the penny again, I might not get 18 drops a second time. Maybe it'll be 19 or maybe it'll be 17. You don't always get the exact same results when you do an investigation. And then a, a third uh, challenge question would be, um, I happen to use the tails side of the dime this time, but would I get the same results if I used the head side? Maybe, maybe not, but because they're not exactly the same, maybe I would get some different um, results. So you could try heads versus tails on these coins as well. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing this screen with you and uh, share my other screen to do a quick recap of what we did today. So again, today's uh, field trip was all about natural sources of water. During this virtual field trip, students discovered that the natural world includes rocks, soil, and water that can be observed in cycles, patterns, and systems. Students observed and compared a variety of natural sources of water, including streams, lakes, and oceans. So first we started, we started off by exploring natural sources of water with Ms. Nash. Next we explored color and clarity of water with Mr. Monroe. Then you saw Dr. Gorman do the investigation with eggs. And you just saw me do the investigation with drops of water on different coins. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate you taking the time to learn about uh, natural sources of water with us. We'd like to know what you think about today's field trip, and you can let us know by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short feedback form for us. Uh, we use that information to improve what we do here with our virtual field trips. We hope to see you again for our next virtual field trip for first grade, which will be coming up in February. Have a great rest of your day, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.